Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. The one is not on. I don't, I don't see him. And there's an echo sounds in my mic. Well, I don't know. Did, does it sound like an echo to you? That's what matters most, I guess, yeah. is how it sounds to everyone else. I don't know if I'm going to sit back. <laughs> is we'll see. Good okay. Too gritty? Good. The picture's good. Everything perfect? Um, you okay. come adjust. Can you switch the camera for her? You adjust. I mean, you... Okay, now? There. Now I see Shabir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shabir is able to see you too, but. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Well, when he speaks, I'd like to be able to see. Right, okay. Imagine you are looking at him. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that sounds good. Then we can go ahead and put mute on both. Doctor, you can put your computer in mute for right now. And uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry for troubling you. Should I turn off the camera as well? Uh, it's completely up to you. But as long just the audio mute, that would be good. OK. We, we can do it from our end here. We can just mute everybody right now. Thank yeah. You. OK, sure. Thank you. Bye-bye.
on mute. Okay. And I'll open my camera. There we go. All right. Good. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Thanks. Well, let me welcome everybody here to this discussion that we're going to have between Dr. Shabir Ali and Reverend Anthony Rogers. The topic of this discussion is going to be, does the Bible teach the Trinity doctrine? Now, before we start, I just want to know, my name is Jim Baber. I'm going to be the moderator for the debate. I know both of our discussion, both of our discussion participants have the time formats. I expect you as discussion participants, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali and Reverend Anthony Rogers, monitor your own time. When we do approach your time, actually when your time is up, I will interrupt and engage in the conversation and ask you to politely wrap it up at that point. However, what I'd like to do first is to have each of our participants, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, if you could just please tell, tell the audience here in three or four sentences, please provide your background, and then when, when we're done with that, we'll move to Reverend Anthony Rogers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I am the president of the Islamic Information Center in uh, Toronto. I function here as an imam. Uh, in terms of my uh, background, uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in uh, uh, comparative religion and uh, a master's and PhD in uh, Quranic exegesis. Uh, in terms of my family, I am married. I have four children and uh, three wonderful grandchildren. Thank you all for being in this uh, dialogue with us. I'm so excited uh, to be here with you and to share thoughts with uh, uh, Pastor uh, Anthony Rogers. Yes, and my name is Anthony Rogers. I have a degree in Christian thought, a Christian philosophy degree from Christ College in Lynchburg, Virginia. I also have a divinity degree from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. I graduated from there a few years ago and became a pastor. I specifically serve in the prisons. I do work for Metanoia, the Greek word for repentance, the Metanoia Prison Ministries. I also have four children, but not yet uh, several grandchildren. So I do look forward to the day when I can say that with Shabir. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to uh, this dialogue with him. And with that, it serves as my reminder to you, we're gonna hold all applause until the end. Um, and, and that also includes any comments you may have favorable or unfavorable to any speaker, please do not voice those. So we'll, you will be asked to leave the room. So we wanna keep everything silent from this point forward until we get to the end. So with that, gentlemen, we are gonna just start here with this introduction type question, and, and that I'm, I'm give each one of you five minutes for this. And um, we'll start here with you, uh, Mr. Rogers. Same question for both. Why is it important for Christian and Muslims to discuss their differences? Five minutes, please. Well, I, I think that Shabir would agree with me in saying that there's nothing more important than who God is. And so from that perspective, not just discussing our differences, but specifically our differences with respect to who God is, his nature, his identity, his character. Uh, so that's the reason this is important. As a Christian, I hold the, hold the distinctive belief that we were made in God's image. And as a result of that, we are to reflect him. And failure to do so is failure to live up to the purpose for which we were made. And it's only in Christ that I believe man who has fallen can be restored to the purity of that image and ultimately enjoy God forever. And so from my perspective, that's why this is important. And I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Okay, so I, I think it's very important that we discuss our similarities and also our differences. Uh, the world is uh, torn apart by violence, by hate, uh, by terrorism and uh, evils of many sorts. Muslims and Christians have a lot in common. We believe in the same one God. Uh, we believe uh, in the basic outline of the Bible with God sending many prophets and messengers to humankind to guide them towards what is right. Uh, we believe uh, in Jesus on whom be peace. For Muslims, Jesus is uh, a great messenger of God, a servant uh, to be sure, but also a, a prophet and a very important uh, man of history 
who showed the way to God. And, uh, and so Muslims uh, uh, revere Jesus and his mother, uh, along with all of the great prophets of the Old uh, Testament. So we have a lot in common. At the same time, uh, I don't want to give the impression that uh, everything we have is in common, because certainly we have some differences, and it is also important to discuss those differences as well. But we must do so in a civil and respectful manner. Uh, we must uh, exhibit uh, the principles of tolerance and uh, mutual uh, a search for truth and uh, mutual acceptance and uh, understanding. Uh, the uh, doctrine of God is very important to both Muslims and Christians. Knowing who exactly is your God is uh, almost the first question of uh, religion. And uh, we hope that tonight's discussion will help us uh, to sort out our own thoughts and to guide our own research uh, to help us decide on our own who exactly is God. Thank you, gentlemen, for the introductory statements. Now, with this, we're going to begin our discussion. And to, to remind everybody, the discussion again is, does the Bible teach the Trinity doctrine? We're going to open up with both discussion participants with an opening statement of 20 minutes each. And we're going to start with Mr. Rogers. Thank you very much. I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the only true triune God. I also want to extend my greeting to all of you who are here and to those who are listening, and also, of course, to Dr. Ali. Without controversy, the most momentous event or complex of events for Old Covenant Israel was her exodus from Egypt, inclusive of her redemption through the blood of the Paschal Lamb, uh, crossing through the waters of the sea on dry ground and uh, the wilderness period that followed it. It was through these events that God, these foundational events, that Israel was constituted as God's redeemed people. And especially relevant to our discussion, it was through these events and the revelatory words that accompanied and interpreted them that Israel came to know and experience Jehovah as her God and Redeemer. Indeed, throughout the book of Exodus, the constant refrain is that God is doing this so that you might know me, so that you might know that I am the Lord, that I am Jehovah. So all of this was to serve the grand overarching purpose of making God himself known. Referring back to this foundational God-revealing event many centuries later, the great prophet Isaiah in chapter 63 of his prophecy attributed Israel's redemption from Egypt to the threefold saving activity of the Father, the angel of his presence, also referred to by ancient Jews as God's word, his logos or memra, and to the Holy Spirit. In other words, those saving actions by which God made himself known to Israel were attributed by the prophet to these three persons. In saying this, Isaiah is picking up on numerous references by Moses to the fact that it was the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses, emphatically declaring himself to be Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Exodus 3. It was the angel of the Lord who slew the firstborn of the Egyptians on Passover night, Exodus 12. It was the angel of the Lord who parted the water so Israel could cross over and who went before and behind Israel into the wilderness in a pillar of fire and cloud, Exodus 14. And moreover, it was the Holy Spirit who was poured out upon Moses, upon Israel's leaders and individuals like Bezalel, Exodus 28, Numbers 11, Nehemiah 9, and so forth. Just as the angel of the Lord went before and behind them, so also the Spirit dwelt in their midst and caused them to experience that temporal deliverance and rest. Now, while it's certainly true that the Lord is one, something stated emphatically by Moses and all the prophets after him in places like Deuteronomy 4, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, the famous Shema, that oneness or unity was never construed as a barren unity, but a unity of three persons. Israel's God was the only God in contrast to the many gods and many lords of the Egyptians and other pagans, but he was not unipersonal. He was not a monad like one finds in various philosophical systems or Unitarian religions, even those that try to ape the Bible. The God of the Bible, the one God, from the beginning and throughout the biblical record, clearly attenuated and explicated that unity along Trinitarian lines. The true God is not a blank, a unity of nothing, 
but three persons who share the one name, the one essence, all the attributes and prerogatives of deity. This is why Moses already in the first chapter of Genesis by inspiration tells us that God prior to the creation of man said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The one God in whose singular image and likeness mankind was made is a plurality of persons. This is why Solomon in agreement with Moses in Ecclesiastes 12.1 could refer to God as Bo Orecha, which means your creators. This is why not just uh, Solomon, but others, uh, David in Psalm 49, uh, 149, 2, or Isaiah in, in Isaiah 54, 5, can refer to God as our makers, Osaich, and uh, as their makers, Bo Osav. In Genesis 3, 22, after the fall of man, we see the same sort of thing. God, after the fall of man, said, behold, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. In Genesis 11, 7, in response to the tower builders, God said, come, let us go down and there confound their language. Over and over again, God speaks in the plural and about himself uh, in the plural. Significantly, many of these passages are interpreted by the Jewish Targumim, the ancient Jews, as a reference to God, his word, his memra, as well as to his Shekhanah or spirit. The, the very thing that Christians believe today and was stated, as I mentioned already, by the prophet Isaiah. Not only does God say us and our in many places, but others refer to God as they and them. In Genesis 20, 13, Abraham said of God, they caused me to wander from my father's house. In Genesis 35, 7, Moses spoke of God being revealed to Jacob in these words. They revealed themselves to him, the literal Hebrew. In Deuteronomy 4, 7, speaking of God drawing near to his people, Moses said, they drew near. 2 Samuel 23, it said of God, they went. These plural verbs, pronouns, and participles in Hebrew explicitly point to a plurality of divine persons who created and made man. There are also passages that involve a subject-object distinction in God, like Genesis 19, 24, where it says of the Lord who went down to Sodom in the form of a man, Jehovah caused it to rain fire and brimstone from heaven from Jehovah. Jehovah from Jehovah. There are passages where God speaks uh, about God, like Genesis 35, 1, where God told Jacob, go up to Bethel and build an altar there to God, referring to God as another. In Exodus 24, 1, the Lord said to Moses, come up the mountain to the Lord. In fact, these passages, even the later Talmudic Jews, in reaction to what was believed by earlier Jews, puzzled over this and said, why does God say, come up to the Lord rather than come up to me? Why does it say from the Lord that the Lord rained fire, not from me or from him and so on and so forth? The same sort of thing is found in Hosea 1.7, where God said, I'll save Israel by Jehovah their God. The use of these prepositions that Jehovah did something from, to, and by Jehovah all entail a subject-object distinction within God, just like those plural verbs, pronouns, and participles I mentioned previously. We also see this personal distinction, distinction indicated in yet other ways. For example, there are passages where Jehovah speaks of being sent or coming from Jehovah. In Genesis 48, 16, Jehovah, the first and the last, says, The Lord God has sent me and his spirit. In Zechariah 2, Jehovah, again speaking, Jehovah says, many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Jehovah being sent by Jehovah. Now, all of this personal plurality language, plural pronouns, plural verb, plural participles, and so on, as well as the use of distinguishing prepositions that indicate subject-object object distinctions in God, or passages involving God speaking to God or about God, God coming from God or being sent by God and so forth, none of this comports with Unitarianism. But it's precisely what you'd expect if the God of the Bible is triune. If the God of the Bible is, as Isaiah said, the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. As I said at the beginning, Israel, for whom all of this was written, already knew this God by experience. He is the God who saved them at the time of the Exodus. When they read these passages or spoke in this way, they knew precisely what this personal plurality language pointed to. It pointed to the Father, to the angel of his presence, and to his spirit. In fact, Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, refers to the Father as God. 
Deuteronomy 32, do you thus deal with Jehovah, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Here he refers to the father as God, as Jehovah. The same thing in Malachi 2.10, Jeremiah 3.4, Malachi 1.6. It's even found in Israelite names, such as Joab, which means Jehovah is my father, or Abihu, which means he is my father, or Abijah, which means uh, my father is Jehovah. This is a thoroughly Jewish Old Testament notion. It was taught by all the prophets. God is the father. But likewise, the deity of the angel of the Lord is clearly taught by Moses and the other prophets. This is why Moses could refer to the angel by the divine name, give him divine attributes, ascribe to him divine prerogatives, say that he's worthy of divine worship. The angel of the Lord is referred to, for example, in Genesis 16, 14, as Jehovah by Moses. Hagar refers to him as El Roi, which means God, the God who sees me. Uh, the angel of the Lord himself in Genesis 31, 13 says, I am the God of Bethel, the one that appeared to you, meaning to Jacob. He refers to himself in Exodus 3 by the divine name. He says, Echyech, Asher, Echyech, I am who I am. I am who I am. The very name from which we get Jehovah was spoken by the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is called God by the Father in Genesis 35, 1. In Genesis 48, 15 and 16, Jacob prayed to the angel of the Lord, asking him to bless his descendants after him. So over and over again, the angel of the Lord is identified as a divine person. The word angel, by the way, in Hebrew doesn't mean a created heavenly being. It can refer to such, but it, that's not the meaning of the word. The word just means messenger or someone who's sent. Likewise, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is clearly identified as a divine person. Already in Genesis 1-2, we're told that the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. The word brooding is only used elsewhere in the Torah to refer to God maintaining and sustaining the work of his hands. So the Spirit is presented as the one who sustains creation. We see the same thing in Psalm 104-30 where it says, You send forth your spirit and they are created and you renew the face of the earth. Uh, uh, Elihu in Job chapter 33 says, The Spirit of God has made me referring to the Spirit as his creator. No wonder God said, let us make man. His Spirit was there in the beginning, and to whom he spoke, along with his ancient word. Uh, in Job, Job 34, we're told that the Spirit, if he were to be withdrawn, that all mankind would perish and return to the dust. So he's also responsible for the divine work of providence. One of my favorite passages, 2 Samuel 23, David refers to the Spirit as the God of Israel, who spoke by him. He uses Hebrew parallelism in verses 2 and 3, clearly indicating the deity of the Spirit. The Spirit is omnipresent. He's referred to as the very presence of God in Psalm 139. In Isaiah 40, 13, we're told that the Spirit is omniscient. No one can instruct the Spirit of the Lord or counsel him. So the Spirit's a person. Uh, on and on, we could go showing the, the names and titles and attributes of deity being applied to all three persons already in the Old Testament. We shouldn't be surprised then when we turn to the new and find the same thing. In fact, I made mention of Isaiah 63 earlier, a passage that looks back to the Exodus and attributes Israel's redemption to the angel of the Lord and the spirit who are sent forth from the Father. That's actually a prayer of Isaiah looking forward to the future for God to do a yet greater work than what he had done in the past because Israel needs something more than a temporal deliverance. She needs deliverance from her sins. So Isaiah is praying for God to do the same thing in the future. And this is exactly what we read in the New Testament. In Galatians 4, the Apostle Paul said, In the fullness of time, God sent out from himself his son, exapastelling, out from himself his, uh, his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And he sent out from himself the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There you have all three persons. In fact, Paul is, by virtue of this schema, identifying the Son as the angel of his presence. Uh, in saying all of this, Paul is saying that this uh, Old Testament background has been fulfilled in a climactic way in the sending of the Son and the Spirit. We see the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10.4, that Jesus is that divine person who appeared in the Old Testament. In 1 Corinthians 10.4, written by Paul in the early 50s, we're told that Jesus is the one who went before and behind Israel in the wilderness. We're told that uh, Jesus, in verse 9, is the one who punished rebellious Israelites, sending fiery serpents among them. Uh, Paul even refers to Jesus in the same epistle as the one Lord through whom all things were made, echoing the Shema. 
Deuteronomy 6, 4, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Yahweh is one. He's referring to Jesus as the one Lord. No less than 33 times, in fact, Paul takes an Old Testament passage about Jehovah and applies it to Jesus. Three more times, that is 75% of the time that he does this, three times more than he ever does this in the case of the Father. So Paul very clearly teaches that Jesus is Jehovah. And we find the same thing throughout the New Testament. Paul was not alone. Uh, in Hebrews chapter uh, 1, Jesus is referred to the, as the Jehovah who made heaven and earth the unchangeable Lord. In Hebrews 11, we're told that Moses chose to be identified with Christ. Christ, <clears throat> I've been talking too much apparently, but uh, he's, he identified with Christ and his people and suffered his reproach rather than with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. How did Moses identify with Christ and his people? The same sort of things were stated by Jude, the brother of Christ, also in the 50s. In Jude 1.4, he refers to Jesus as our only master and Lord. Again, echoing the Shema. And in the next verse, he says that Jesus is the one who led the people out of Egypt and then subsequently destroyed those who didn't believe. Elsewhere in the epistle of Jude, he speaks of believers as those who pray through the power of the indwelling spirit, thereby keeping themselves in the love of God, the Father, and looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Writing in the early 40s, the Apostle James referred to Jesus as the Lord of glory. He even uses an appositional construction, meaning he's saying that he is the Lord in precisely this sense. He is the glory. It's an echo of Exodus 40, where it talks about the Lord as the glory and, and descending and dwelling in the tabernacle uh, with Israel in the wilderness. Besides these earliest of all apostolic writings, Paul, Jude, and James, the fourfold gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John teach the same thing. It teaches this already believed high Christology and high pneumatology, which flows right out of the Old Testament and ancient Judaism and is based on the certain facts that were fulfilled among them, the coming of the Son from the Father and the pouring out of the Spirit upon the church. For example, all four gospel accounts of the gospel history identify Jesus as the coming of Jehovah prophesied in Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 40, it's a prophecy about the new and greater exodus that God would accomplish. And it says that God himself would come and his way would be prepared by a voice crying out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. That prophecy, according to the gospel writers, was fulfilled in Jesus, whose way was prepared by John the Baptist. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Later, in that same context of Isaiah, we're told that the coming Lord would pour out his spirit. Isaiah 44, 3, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. In Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, John 1, we're told that this is exactly what Jesus was going to do. In fact, to quote one of them in Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he is who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The same thing that we see in the case of the Exodus, the angel of the Lord saving the people, the spirit being poured out upon them is being reenacted, but now for the sake of eternal redemption. The son has taken flesh and is going to die for our sins, and as a consequence of that, is going to pour out his life-giving spirit, which is exactly what the New Testament says was done by Jesus. And the apostles say yet more, uh, certainly. They explicitly refer to him as God in places like Matthew 1.23, God with us, Emmanuel, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, 1, John 20.28. 20, the apostle Paul refers to Jesus as God in 2 Thessalonians 1.12, Romans 9.5, Titus 2.13. Hebrews 1.8, a, a text most believe was a sermon written by Paul. Uh, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 2.9, Paul called Jesus uh, the, the fullness of deity in bodily form, using a very particular and strong word there. Uh, in Philippians 2, Paul speaks of Christ as existing in the form of God, and, and by virtue of that, having equality with God. But he says he didn't use that equality to his own advantage, but humbled himself, taking the form or nature of a servant, the very thing Isaiah also said about the coming Lord. He would not only be Jehovah, but he would come in the role of a servant and accomplish redemption. All of this is why Matthew could say that the church's great commission, her God-given task in the world, is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name, Ta'anama, the one name, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
All three persons are the one God, Jehovah. All three persons co here in the one divine essence. They all share the same divine identity. The doctrine of the Trinity is not a denial of the unity of God, but the God-revealed explication of that unity, which was first disclosed to the Israelites when the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit delivered them from physical bondage, and then was disclosed afresh for the benefit of the entire world in the fullness of time, when the Son came forth from the Father as the paschal lamb to accomplish eternal redemption, and as a result of that, pour out his Spirit. For this reason, the Christian church has, throughout its history, confessed this doctrine. There have been heretics, there have been heresies, just like there has been in the case of Islam, and the church has had to constantly correct those heretics and correct those heresies and articulate its faith in, in the face of all of these things. And the church has done so. The church has done so from day one. You can find this teaching in the earliest uh, post-apostolic writers like Clement of Rome, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, on and on the list could go. When the church finally codified her beliefs in formal creeds, it wasn't the church making up this doctrine, but the church saying, no, this is what we've always believed and will continue to believe in spite of the fact that heretics will try and contravene it. And I'll conclude with that. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. Now we're going to move to Dr. Ali, who's going to have his 20-minute opening statement. Dr. Ali. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, I begin by praising the creator and fashioner of the heavens and the earth. And I give thanks to him uh, for bringing us together in this cordial atmosphere so that we can think together about uh, our duty to him as uh, the only uh, true God. I ask God to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, all of the righteous people of all time. I ask God to bless you all, bless all of your loved ones, keep you all safe from COVID-19 and from every other disease and stress and distress. I pray to God for world peace uh, and for peace in the countries in which we live. Uh, I pray for the United States of America and for Canada and uh, for the entire world. So... <clears throat> Let me uh, mention some uh, opening thoughts, picking up from the last point that uh, Anthony shared with us, and that is the establishment of the great Christian creeds. We know about the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, when it was declared that Jesus is the very God of very God. Now, uh, it, the matter did not end there, because in the Council of Constantinople in 381, an amendment had to be made to the Nicene Creed there, uh, it was thought necessary to add that the Holy Spirit is worshipped along with the Father and the Son. So that was in the year 381. Many decades span from the year 325 to 381. And it is obvious that in, that de in those decades, Christians had to think more clearly, why did we not mention the Holy Spirit? And he ought to be mentioned there as one who is worshipped along with the Father and the Son. But now let's go back to pre-Nicene. There, there is a creed that uh, is attributed to the apostles, uh, though not necessarily from the apostles. Uh, this is uh, uh, thought to be from the second century. Now in that creed, it is uh, declared that Jesus is the Son of God, but it is not declared that he is very God of very God. So we can see here a development from the second century uh, apostolic creed, the Apostles' Creed, and then at two, the Nicene Creed in the year 325, and then further on to the uh, Constantinopolitan uh, Creed uh, from the year 381. There is a development. First, Jesus is declared to be the Son of God. Then he is declared to be very God of very God uh, a couple of centuries later. And then uh, many decades later, the Holy Spirit is included in, in worship as well uh, for Christians. The Athanasian Creed, uh, which is uh, attributed to Athanasius, but probably really is not from Athanasius, nevertheless is uh, placed uh, in about the 5th century of Christianity, so a century after the great uh, Nicene Creed. The Athanasian Creed uh, reads something like this. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet these are not three gods but one God. And, and on and on it goes like this until finally it declares this is how you must think of the Trinity in order to be saved. Now, to uh, look at this, we, we realize that you cannot credit these detailed beliefs to the writers of the Bible because these beliefs were not yet formulated in, in this precise way. Now, notice that the Athanasian Creed says that you must uh, believe like this in order to be saved. 
if Christians say that these are the beliefs that must be had in order to be saved, well then uh, you must go back and, and realize that uh, the writers of the Old and the New Testaments did not have this belief. And then the question is, how were they uh, really saved? Uh, now, to put it in a nutshell then, we cannot uh, attribute these doctrines to the uh, writers themselves of the New Testament because that would be anachronistic. It's attributing to them a belief that was not there. It's like saying that the New Testament writers believed in the American Constitution. Well, hello, uh, the Constitution was not written in their lifetimes. Second, uh, think about the, the way in which uh, the doctrine is presented to us, especially in the Athanasian Creed. And you realize that it's hard for Christians to uh, predict in advance that the next person they meet, the next Christian they meet, is going to have this belief. It's a very precise belief. And if we look at the way this is uh, formulated in the Westminster Confession from the Presbyterian Church, uh, or, or that is followed by the Presbyterian Church, uh, or uh, you even look at some doctrinal statements, for example, in Ministry to Muslims, their doctrinal statement, you see that there is a great deal of equivocation uh, when it comes to who exactly is God. Now, the fallacy of equivocation occurs like this. When you use a term in, in what you're describing, uh, but the, the meaning of the term changes as you are describing what you're describing, and then the final conclusion depends on that shift in the terminology, well, then this is the fallacy of equivocation. How does this occur in our dialogues between Christians and Muslims? Well, our Christian friends uh, do not stick to one definition of God. First, they speak of God as, uh, as being one God, and then we're happy to hear that. And then they say, well, God is three persons. And then we say, okay, well, three persons, all right. And then they say, well, each one of the persons is God. So then if you had one God from the start, and now you have three persons, each of whom is God, uh, did that, how, how do you still have one God? And Christians do try to explain this, but their explanations uh, uh, tend to be uh, confusing to, to Muslims. And uh, many Christians confess in their writings that in fact, this is confusing to Christians themselves. So now you cannot attribute such a doctrine to the New Testament or the Old. If you say that uh, the, the Old Testament writers uh, were saying that Jesus is God or that the Holy Spirit is God, then the best way of, uh, of, of making sense of the Old and New Testament is to say that for them, there is only one God as they repeatedly state, uh, but in some way they think that the Holy Spirit is associated with God, in some way they think that Jesus is associated with God, but not that Jesus or the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, a separate uh, person uh, in, in a Godhead. Now think about the term Godhead. Now where does that term Godhead come from? You will look at uh, statements like the Westminster Confession of Faith and you will see that in the first uh, article, there is only one God. And then in the second article, suddenly uh, there is mention of the Godhead without any prior definition. So where does this term Godhead come from? Uh, the Bible declares there is only one God. It, 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 there is no statement uh, that, that in the Bible that says that there is only one Godhead. And here we see that Christians have, uh, in order to uh, explain their doctrine of the Trinity, have had to invent terms like Godhead and then person. The Bible does not say anywhere that there are three persons in God or that God is in three persons. So the, the very term person had to be invented. And uh, it, the term person initially was confusing for Christians because when it was first uh, used in Greek, it meant a mask that one would wear in a, in a theatrical play uh, to represent a different persona. Uh, but then it, when it was translated into Latin, it took on the meaning of persons as we, ha as we understand them now. A person being an individual who has a sense of self, like I'm an individual person. I am not uh, Pastor George Saig, and Pastor George knows himself to be separate and distinct from, from me. So there is an I and thou relationship. Uh, so if for the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to have this I and thou relationship between themselves and yet uh, and so be three distinct persons and yet be one God, this leads to a further problem. How do you know uh, that, that they're actually one God besides, of course, the, the bland statement that they are actually 
uh, one God. Like, how do you conceive of them being one God? Are, is God uh, here a kind of a board of directors? You have three directors within the board and they're all working in unison. And hence we have something like a social trinity, which many Christians move towards today. Uh, or is, uh, is God one being uh, and and somehow that God is manifested in three different ways, uh, but they're not individual persons. And some Christians may think about it, that, it in that way. In both of these ways, we find that uh, uh, the criticism is that these are blasphemies, these are heretical beliefs, they're not actually the true uh, Christian belief. So you see how difficult it would be to actually credit these back to uh, the, the writers of the Old and New Testaments. No. What is more clear is that the writers of the Old and, and New Testaments uh, had a, a wide variety of beliefs about God. And some of these beliefs, to be sure, are confusing, but we must make sense of it uh, by, by interpreting the Bible in a canonical uh, manner. We interpret uh, one passage in light of the other and then the whole Bible uh, as a whole. First of all, the New Testament has to be interpreted in the light of the Old. Why? Because the New Testament acknowledges the validity of the Old, but the Old Testament does not acknowledge the validity of the New Testament. So, for example, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, uh, referring to the scriptures which Timothy knew from childhood, is actually referring to the Old Testament. Uh, now, when we go to the Old Testament, uh, we find that there are confusing passages which, uh, you know, have Yahweh speaking about Yahweh and you wonder how many Yahwehs are there. Uh, the, the reason for this we know because historically the, the writers of portions of the Old Testament lived in a time in which uh, the scholars are now saying that uh, polytheism was a rampant belief even among the Israelites. And so uh, there was not that clear distinction between the one monotheistic God and all of his creatures as Muslims and Christians and Jews today uh, are accustomed to, to make, so that, to make that distinction. Uh, and so we find there are confusing passages which a Trinitarian can look at and say, oh, th this is where it, we have evidence that there is a, a plurality of persons. But in fact, all of those passages were tamed in the Old Testament uh, with clear, explicit statements about how many gods there are, uh, and for that matter, uh, how many uh, um, uh, persons there are within that uh, one God, because the, 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 there is no um, a distinction in the in these passages between saying, okay, there's one God, but God can be many persons. The idea that God can be many persons is something that is read back by Trinitarians into a text that does not really support the Trinitarian uh, belief. So we have uh, statements like uh, 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 Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 39, uh, where clearly it is declared that Jehovah is the only God. Now, when it is declared that Jehovah is the only God, now we're on to something because God now has a name. And, uh, and he says in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 14 and forward, that this is the name by which he should be identified. And when we know that, we realize that there is only one God whose name is Jehovah. Now, we come to the New Testament. And uh, um, Pastor George has cited passages which show that the New Testament authors took Jesus to be Jehovah. But then this leads to a further problem, because if Jesus is Jehovah and he's the only God, and clearly in the New Testament Jesus has uh, a father, uh, then uh, who is the father of Jehovah? And when Jehovah in the Old Testament declared that he is the only God, that means that Jesus declared that he is the only God, and yet he has a father. So there is a father of the only God. And this too is a conundrum. And it is interesting that uh, some Christian uh, writers, uh, for example, Justin Martyr, uh, following later, uh, took the same view that uh, Anthony has uh, presented uh, today, that Jesus is Jehovah. Uh, and of course, we know that Jehovah has a, uh, Jesus has a father, and that would lead to the idea that uh, Jehovah uh, had a father. And this was Justin Martyr's idea. But that idea uh, was clearly diminished uh, over the centuries until eventually uh, Christians, in declaring in the great creeds that uh, Jesus is the Son of God, uh, they don't mean that he is Jehovah, but they mean that there is only one God, the Father, and Jesus is the Son uh, of God. Of course, that developed further in the Nicene, uh, in the Nicene Creed, developed further into the Constantinopolitan Creed, and uh, eventually the idea that uh, there are three persons in the one Godhead 
uh, became a settled doctrine. But most Christians today uh, would take Jesus to be the son of Jehovah, as opposed to what Anthony has presented, uh, uh, meaning that he's claiming that Jesus is actually Jehovah. Now, Looking at the New Testament more clear, more closely now, now we have seen the big picture and we see that you cannot really attribute the doctrine of the Trinity to uh, the earliest Christians. We see that the writers of the New Testament present Jesus in a variety of ways, some with a low Christology, some with a high Christology, some with a low view uh, of Jesus's person, some with a high view of Jesus's person. But the highest Christology we will find about Jesus in, that, uh, in, in the New Testament, if it is properly understood in the light of the old, uh, is that uh, Jesus is, uh, yes, the Son of God, uh, yes, the person who, through whom God created everything, but yet the, the writers maintain that Jesus himself is not God, but he has a God. Uh, for example, in John's Gospel, uh, John does not say Jesus is God. Jesus, uh, John's Gospel says Jesus is the Word who was with God. And in John chapter 1, verse number 2 says, Hutos, uh, in an arche kai proston, uh, hutos in an arche proston theon. He is the one who was there with God in the beginning. So if John is calling Jesus God, uh, why would he then say uh, that he was he is the one who was with God in the beginning? No, there is only one that uh, John is calling the true God, and that's the one that Jesus was praying to in John chapter 17, verse number 3, when he looked up into heaven and said that they may know you as the only true God and Jesus, your messenger, as Christ. So there's a clear distinction between Jesus, uh, the, the Christ, and his God, who is the only God of everyone. If you look at Paul's writings, we see that Paul shows Jesus to be in a subordinate position. Uh, with respect to the Father, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there is only uh, the, the, the head of every woman is her husband, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. So there's a hierarchy of beings here in, in, in Paul's thought uh, with women below, God on top, and Christ below uh, God. Uh, so we cannot say that in Paul's writings, uh, Jesus is presented as the Almighty God. Certainly, Paul makes some reference to Jesus, which uh, uh, Anthony can pick upon and say, well, this means that Jesus is uh, the Lord Jehovah. But no, while these uh, statements are tantalizing, uh, uh, and sometimes there's confusion with, with uh, Paul saying the Lord, sometimes we don't know which Lord he's referring to. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is clear that uh, for Paul, Jesus has a subordinate position. And it's not only a subordinate position in this world, uh, because uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 28, that in the end, uh, Jesus will hand, the Christ will hand everything back to the Father so that the Father will be all in all. And that shows that he will uh, persistently retain a subordinate position uh, under uh, the Father. So uh, if we turn now to Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse number 4, has Paul declared that there is in fact only one God. And then in John, uh, in, in the same 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 6, he says there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So he's distinguishing for the purpose of that verse uh, at the moment uh, between what the one he's going to call God and the one he is going to call uh, Lord. And clearly for him, there is only one God, the one who is called uh, the Father. Uh, we go to the other writings uh, where we have a high Christology, and we go, for example, to Hebrews. Well, we don't know who wrote Hebrews and what exactly the author of Hebrews was thinking. Uh, you cannot even know that the author of Hebrews actually believed in only one God because we don't know who this person was. Uh, so whatever he's presented has to be interpreted in the light of the rest of the New Testament, where clearly it is declared that there is only one and God. And in Hebrews, we find that though there are references to passage in, passages in the Old Testament uh, that would tantalizingly, again, give the impression that Jesus is high above uh, the creation, at the same time in Hebrews as well, Jesus is shown to be a lowly creature of God who grows in wisdom, whereas, of course, as the Westminster Confession uh, declares, uh, God's uh, wisdom has always been with God. He doesn't increase or grow in wisdom. And uh, we turn uh, to uh, the book of Revelation, where we have also a very high Christology. The Lamb of God is there on the throne and is worshipped along with the Father. Uh, but uh, as uh, 
pointed out by uh, Professor James McGrath in his book, The Only True God. In the book of Revelation, uh, we have also that Christians will eventually be worshipped by others. That doesn't make Christians God, but in the uh, conception of the writer of the book of Revelation, whoever that writer was, uh, th all of these things are possible. So the clear distinction between the one God and somebody else who is not God is a bit blurred. But nonetheless, even for the book of Revelation, as we see in Revelation chapter 3, uh, Jesus has a God. Uh, the one who is referred to as the Lamb of God and, and is worshipped, he has a God. And that shows that there is a hierarchy of beings. Uh, there is the one God above and Jesus is somewhere below that God. Uh, in sum. Uh, when we look at both the Old and the New Testaments and we interpret the New Testament in the light of the Old and we interpret the writers in terms of what was possible as beliefs in their own times, but also in terms of the specific wording that they have given us, it is clear uh, that the New Testament writers, as did the Old Testament writers, uh, stuck to the declaration that there is only one God. And even though the New Testament writers gave us some tantalizing pieces, which may seem to indicate that Jesus has uh, a very close glorified uh, uh, personality. Uh, nonetheless, for the New Testament writers, it is very clear that Jesus is subordinate to God. He is a servant and he's a messenger of God. And uh, it is to the one God, the true God that Jesus prayed to, that I invite our Christian friends uh, to pray to as well as Jesus declared in John chapter 17, uh, verse number three. So uh, thank you all for your patient listening. I'm so delighted to have shared these uh, thoughts uh, with you. I look forward to Anthony's uh, response to what I've uh, said. And I will, of course, uh, engage more specifically with some of the other things that he said in his opening uh, presentation. So thank you all for listening. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Ali. This now concludes our opening statements. We are going to move to a rebuttal format where each of our participants has 15 minutes, we'll begin with you, Reverend Rogers. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Shabir, for that presentation. I was uh, quite shocked uh, that the topic of our debate is, does the Bible teach the doctrine of the Trinity? And yet, for at least eight or nine minutes of Shabir's opening statement, he discussed the supposed development in Christian theology reflected in the early creeds. Uh, now, I don't agree with Shabir's assessment, and anybody who's read the patristic literature knows that's just not true. I will say something about it, even though it's off topic. Otherwise, I don't have uh, as much to deal with. Uh, I have 15 minutes, and if I don't deal with what he spent nine minutes on, then uh, I've got not a whole lot to say. Uh, he claimed that the creeds reflect a development because at Constantinople, the explicit statement of the Spirit being worshipped together with Father and Son is stated there. It's not found in the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed says that Jesus is very God of very God, uh, but that's not found in the earlier creed, the Apostles' Creed, which calls him the Son of God. Of course, Shabir does acknowledge, by the way, that this is not Islam by any stretch, right? None of these things reflect Islamic theology, and all of them, it, re it confesses faith in God the Father Almighty. But here is something that Shabir missed. These creeds didn't require all of this explicit language apart from the objection of heretics to which Christians were responding. The Christian church always understood the Apostles' Creed as a declaration of faith in all three persons as the one true God. That was the whole point of the later uh, affirmations at Nicaea. No, you're wrong to say this is what we mean and this is what we believe as Christians. That's why the, the statement was made explicit that he is homoousios, meaning of one essence with the Father. That's why the Spirit then had to be explicitly uh, stated as one worship together with Father and Son at, at Constantinople in 381, because additional heretics came along and wanted to deny what the Creed had always been understood to believe. And one of the indications that should show you this is actually something that Shabir helped us to see. Shabir said that what Anthony's teaching sounds very much like what Justin Martyr taught, right? If what I'm saying is very much like Justin, what, what Justin Martyr taught, Think about this. Justin Martyr affirmed the Apostles' Creed. Well, Justin Martyr believed what I taught, according to Shabir. He admits this. My whole point here is this was the faith of the ancient church. It didn't always get articulated in exactly the same way, but heretical denials often required the church to make more explicit statements on some of these matters. Now, what about the more important question of what does the Bible teach? In my opening presentation, I spent a good bit of time, and I do hope that Shabir, in his rebuttal, will spend time trying to interact with this. 
in the Old Testament, you don't only have the clear declaration of God's unity, which I mentioned, Deuteronomy 4.35, 4.39, Deuteronomy 6.4, Isaiah 40 through chapter 45. There's no question the Old Testament teaches the unity of God. But what I also pointed out is that unity is not explicated along unipersonal lines. It never says that God is one person. Shabir says, where does it use the word Godhead? Well, fine, let's ditch the word Godhead. Where does it ever say God was one person? But Shabir uh, talked to us about how the Greek term uh, person was first understood and then later understood. Well, Shabir believes that God is one person, so apparently he doesn't have too much trouble with that word. Uh, but in any case, the Old Testament is not only clear that there's only one God, it's also clear that that one God is a plurality of persons or whatever term you want to use for it. Personal subjects, individuals, self-aware uh, consciousness, uh, consciences. Uh, the Father speaks to the Son and about the Son and, and vice versa. God speaks as a plural, let us make man. God is referred to as they and them. God speaks to God and about God, is sent by God. You have the prepositions that I mentioned. Clearly, Scripture teaches not only that there's one God, but that there's a plurality of persons who are that one God. And it specifies who those persons are. In Deuteronomy 32, Malachi 1, Malachi 2.10, Jeremiah 3.4, all these passages refer to the Father as God. Exodus uh, 3, in fact, Shabir referred to this as a clear text. I hope you heard this. Exodus 3 is a, an example of a clear text where you have God identifying himself as Jehovah. Well, who is it according to the text, that clear text that's calling himself Jehovah? Verse 2, the angel of the Lord. It was the angel of the Lord who clearly declared himself to be Jehovah, I am that I am. The angel of the Lord also declares himself to be Jehovah or the God of Bethel in Genesis 31, 13. Jacob refers to him as his God and shepherd in Genesis 48, 15 through 16. The father refers to him as God in Genesis 35, 1. Hosea 12 explicitly refers to the angel who wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32 as Jehovah. It's, it's a, he says Jehovah is his name, his memorial name. Explicit, one-to-one -one, uh, uh, equation there being made. So this is the clear teaching of the Old Testament, and it's just as clear with respect to the Spirit. There's no ambiguity about whether the Spirit is a distinct person from the Father. The Father sends the Spirit. The Spirit comes from the Father. Note the prepositions. To, from, by, I mean, all of these things indicate a distinction, and it's clearly a personal distinction. In Psalm 139, the Spirit is portrayed as the very presence of God, so the Spirit's identified as divine. He's omnipresent, in fact. David says, there's nowhere I can go in heaven or on earth where I can flee from him. So he's not a creature. He's omnipresent. He created the world, according to Job 33. Job 34, he upholds and governs the world. Psalm 104:30, he created the world. And the Spirit speaks over and over again throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit speaks. 2 Samuel 23, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. Notice it didn't say that I spoke by the power of the Spirit, although those statements are made too. It specifically says the Spirit spoke by me. The Spirit used David as his mouthpiece. The Spirit dwelt in his temple as if it was, or dwelt in his mouth, as the older writers used to say, as if it were his temple. He dwelt there and he spoke through them. This is the very thing Jehovah said he would do in the prophets. I'll put my words in their mouth. Deuteronomy 18, Jeremiah chapter 1, all these passages. Father, angel of his presence, Holy Spirit are identified as that one true God that was worshipped by Israel. There's no ambiguity here. Uh, there's also no ambiguity in the New Testament. There's no development, as, as Shabir is suggesting. Uh, remarkably, he says that John doesn't call Jesus God. He quoted John 1.1. 1, 1. He quoted two two thirds of the verse. I hope you heard that, or at least one third. He quoted the second clause of John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1 1, 1 doesn't just say the word was with God. It says Kai Theos ein Halagos, and God was the word. The word was God. The following sentence, Hutos, is referring back to that word, saying this one was in the beginning with God. So what's the upshot? The word is God, and the word was God. Let me ask you, does that sound like Unitarianism or does it sound like Trinitarianism? It's clearly a, a declaration of the deity of Christ. Shabir also said that John contradicts this, or at least shows that this is not the proper understanding in John 17, 3, because Jesus there referred to the Father as the only true God. 
Now, in the first place, that's not a denial of what Christians believe. I believe the Father is the only true God. All Christians here believe the Father is the only true God. What we do not believe is that only the Father is the only true God. And if you look at the Greek construction, the word monos, only, modifies the word true, which further modifies the word God. It does not modify the word Father. Jesus did not say only the Father is the true God. He said the Father is the only true God, a fundamental tenet of Trinitarianism. So the same Apostle John identifies Jesus as the true God and the Father as the true God. I could go on to talk about how the, the Apostle John speaks of the Spirit in John 14 through 16. But Shabir didn't make a point regarding that, so I'll gloss over it. Uh, he referred to Paul, said that Paul says some tantalizing things about Jesus. Well, they're more than tantalizing. They'd be blasphemous if they weren't true. Colossians 2.9, Paul said, In Christ dwells all the fullness of deity in bodily form. In fact, by the way, the older English translations use the word Godhead. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, the deity in bodily form. Uh, the Apostle Paul also spoke of the Son having equality with God. It's not a subordination, as, as Dr. Shabir suggested. It's not a subordination. In Philippians 2, verse 6, it says, He existed, or existing, who park on, he uses the participle, he existing in the form of God. He did not e consider the equality, it's articular in the Greek, the equality that he had with God, something to be used to his own advantage. So the, the Son is by very nature, God, and did not use that equality to his own advantage. But notice, it's an equality that he has with God, something Jesus himself taught in the Gospel of John, which, as I already pointed out, teaches a high Christology. John 5, 18, the Jews wanted to kill him because in calling God his own father, he was making himself equal with God. So the New Testament writers are not uh, giving us a uh, an upgraded view of Jesus that's still lower than absolute deity, uh, not, not even the statements in 1 Corinthians 11 or 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, where Christ uh, it says that the Father is the head of Christ, uh, or where it speaks of the Son giving up the kingdom to the Father. Notice that, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, it's talking about Christ as the head of the church. How is Christ the head of the church? He's the head of all things, we would say, as the eternal God, but he became the head of the church by virtue of taking our flesh upon himself. We are united to him because he took upon himself our nature. It is in that sense that he's referred to as the head of the church, and it is in that context that the Father is referred to as the head of Christ. Christ is, in that sense, submitted to the Father for the sake of us men and our redemption. It's not talking about his eternal, essential deity, but rather his condescension for our salvation. Uh, Dr. Shear also said that the book of Hebrews teaches a low Christology. Uh, but it makes some tantalizing remarks, mind you. Here's, here's some of those tantalizing remarks. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says that through Christ, the ages were made. All the ages were made by the Son. It says that the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his very nature, his very being. Does that just sound tantalizing to you, or does it sound like Paul is saying he's the second person of the Godhead? Sorry to use the word Godhead, by the way. Does it sound to you like he's just making tantalizing remarks or full-blown statements of his absolute deity when he says in Hebrews 1.8 that the Father said of the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He ascribes to him an eternal throne in the very breath that he calls him God. Does it sound merely tantalizing when he says in Hebrews 1.10 of the Son, in the beginning, O Lord, Jehovah, he uses the, he's quoting the Old Testament. In the beginning, O Lord, you, the Son, laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth. They're the work of your hands. They will perish, but you'll remain. Your years will never end. He refers to Jesus as the unchanging Lord who made heaven and earth. That's not just tantalizing, folks. That is the very thesis that I'm defending in this debate. Jesus is the eternal God, the second person of the Trinity. And so is the Spirit. I already mentioned 2, Thess or 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. The Spirit spoke, and, he, and he's referred to there as the God of Israel. Acts chapter 5, the Spirit is called God. Uh, Peter says, you haven't lied to men, but to God, meaning the Spirit in the context. Hebrews, he, uh, Shabir mentioned Hebrews. Over and over again, Hebrews goes back and forth in one chapter saying the Spirit said something, and then quotes the same thing and says this, no, Jehovah said this. Not, it doesn't say no Jehovah, but it says the Spirit said it, and then later it says Jehovah said it, because the Spirit is Jehovah. The Spirit is the very Jehovah who speaks. I was astounded that uh, Dr. Shabir, excuse me, Dr. Ali said that the book of Revelation doesn't teach a high Christology. Again, it's merely tantalizing. 
Uh, even though Jesus in Revelation 5, he said, receives universal worship. Universal worship, not the, the worship that he's talking about in Revelation 3, supposedly given to the saints. Universal worship, the same worship given to the Father. All creatures in heaven, on earth, and under the earth are said to worship the one seated on the throne and the Lamb. He's given the identical worship that's given to the Father. Moreover, the Son is referred to, it refers to himself as the first and the last in the book of uh, uh, Revelation. Revelation 1.8. Listen to the verse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Who is it that's coming according to the book of Revelation? Well, anybody who's read the book already knows the answer to that question. It's the Lord Jesus. In fact, it's the Lord Jesus who's coming according to the context. The verse immediately preceding verse 8, this is what it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, even those who pierced him. So in verse 8, the next verse says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. It's referring to the one who was pierced. That's, again, not merely a tantalizing statement about Jesus. It's calling him the Lord God, the Almighty. If you still think after hearing this that this is merely tantalizing, I, I don't mean to be offensive to anyone, but I, I want to be frank with you. You're not looking, you're not, you're not seeing, your eyes are covered over. And you might want to cry out to God and ask him, why is something that should be so crystal clear merely tantalizing to me? Lord, please remove the scales from my eyes so that I might see these things, so that I might behold the one who was pierced for me, who is not merely a human being, but God himself in the flesh. That's what I hope you'll do after this debate tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ is declared to be God throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament. I, I, I didn't even quote half the verses I could have quoted. I could have looked at Old Testament messianic texts about the, the Messiah. Isaiah 7, 14, calling him Emmanuel, God with us. I quoted Matthew, quoting that verse, but not Isaiah. Isaiah 9, 5, 9, 6, where he's referred to as El Gibor, the mighty God, and Aviad, the, the father or possessor of eternity. I could have quoted uh, Jeremiah 23, 6, where he's referred to as Jehovah, our righteousness, the branch, the coming branch. Is that time? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Rogers, for the rebuttal. We're now going to move to Dr. Ali. You're free to begin your 15-minute rebuttal. Yes. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for that uh, moving uh, rebuttal and spirited uh, reply to some of the things that I mentioned. So let me uh, quickly... Uh, try to also reply to some of the things that uh, you have uh, said. Um, I wanted to reset my timer, and uh, I didn't do that. So, okay, looks like I'm, I'm not too far off, so I'll go with that. Um, so, uh, Anthony says, well, uh, Shabir spent so much time dealing with the development. I think Anthony missed the point, because the historical development actually uh, shows what it was possible for a, a certain writer to think in his milieu. And his writings should not be interpreted uh, outside of what was possible for people to think at the time. Uh, so since these doctrines developed later, we cannot uh, guarantee that the writers of the New Testament actually had this uh, complicated uh, Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And if you don't have that doctrine of the Trinity, there is no way that you can take Jesus to be God and still be a monotheist. So let's put this all in perspective. Nowadays, Christians accept that Christianity, to be true, must be monotheist. There must be only one God. And to guarantee that you believe in that one God, while taking Jesus and the Spirit as separate persons, you must think of them precisely in this way. There must be one God, but there must be three God persons, not three gods. Now, if you go to a New Testament writing and you see that somebody is presenting Jesus in what I call a tantalizing way, and you say, aha, that means that this writer is saying that Jesus is God. For you to attribute that thought to that writer, you have to be very sure that that writer has a way of conceptualizing this, as Christians would do today, uh, to, to, to guarantee that there is still only one God and, and not three. 
And, and you have no way of guaranteeing that because you have no way of guaranteeing that the next Christian you meet will have the same idea of, of the Trinity. We see in history that there have been all kinds of ideas regarding the, the, the Trinity uh, or, or about Godhead. Uh, one idea of the Trinity is that there is an economic Trinity, but not necessarily that, uh, and that this means that uh, th there is an ontological uh, Trinity. So economy of Trinity means that we are being saved by, by God creating us, the, uh, the the Son redeeming us, the Holy Spirit sanctifying us. But there's no statement here about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each together uh, sharing the divine essence and therefore becoming being one God. Uh, so what Anthony has to establish here uh, today, I think he has not quite uh, shown cognizance of, is that he has to show that each of these three uh, by by himself is is God in its entirety, and uh, he has to show that this is only one God. Not only that, but he has to show that the New Testament and the Old Testament teaches this. And to say that this is what the Old and New Testament teach, teach, he would have to attribute to those writers doctrines which actually came to be spelled out later on. Now, he said that uh, Justin Martyr believed in the Apostles' Creed. I, I highly doubt that because, the, you know, you would have to find me uh, some a clear historical reference that shows that Justin Martyr actually believed that. I'll come back to that. But what does the Apostles' Creed actually say the apostles creed doesn't even say that jesus is to be worshipped look what it says i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ his only son our lord he was conceived in the power by the power of the holy spirit and born of the virgin mary he suffered under pontius pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father he will come again to judge the living and the dead that's it about the Son. Nothing about the Son being worshipped. So clearly you have the Apostles' Creed in which the Son is not worshipped. Uh, you have the Nicene Creed in which the Son is worshipped. And then you have the uh, uh, Constantinopolitan Creed in which the Holy Spirit is also worshipped. So Son not worshipped, Son worshipped, both Son and Spirit worship. You see there's a clear development over the centuries here. As for Justin Martyr, Justin Martyr believed that Jesus was a second God, a Deuteros Theos, that, that he believed to be the Logos, a Deuteros Theos, a second God. So now Christians won't speak that language. Uh, I, I won't hear Anthony saying that Jesus was a second God. He would have to say that Jesus was the second person of the Holy Trinity. Yes, he's God, but not a second God. So we see even a development of belief from Justin Martyr to uh, Anthony. Uh, but of course, they have the common uh, belief that Jesus was Jehovah. And, and that is a common belief that they share with Mormons as well, because Mormons uh, b believe, though, of course, there's, there are many things that um, uh, Anthony would object to in Mormon belief, but nonetheless, they share a common conception uh, that Jehovah is the, uh, the uh, Jesus, and, and that Jehovah has a father who is the supreme uh, being. And, and so uh, we, we do not have a clear establishment of the Christian doctrine throughout the ages. Here is a book. He's asking for, uh, you know, authentication of this. And this is by Robert Grant, a historian, entitled uh, The Early Christian Doctrine of God. And it is clear from this book and many others that I have right here on my table uh, that uh, there was a development of Christian doctrine over the ages. I don't know why he uh, finds it necessary uh, to uh, uh, to deny that, that, that such a change in development occurred. He says that there, while there is a, a clear declaration in the Old Testament of God's unity, um, uh, there are also indications of a plurality. But we should understand where that uh, indication mostly has come from. Uh, the, the Old Testament, uh, parts of it at least, were written uh, in, in a time when Israel believed in the plurality of gods. And they were also influenced by the polytheism in their surrounding. Uh, so whereas the Canaanites uh, refer to the gods, uh, the term for God that came to be established in the Old Testament is Elohim, which is a plural term. And the writers did not quite know what to make of this. Sometimes they treated it as, as, as a plural term. Sometimes they treated it as a singular term. But Elohim literally means gods. So uh, when it says in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, 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 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, the, the, uh, it literally means 
uh, gods in the beginning, gods created the heavens and the and the earth. But of course, I don't want anyone to translate it that way today. Uh, but what uh, Christians need to understand is that uh, the, there are passages in the Old Testament which uh, might give uh, a sense of polytheism, uh, but uh, one has to tame that in the light of whatever else the Bible says. And especially in the Old Testament, it is clearly declared that there is only one God. So we have to interpret the problematic and the difficult statements in the light of that which is clear and, and clearly stated about, about our subject. So when the writers are clearly stating that there is only one God, and then we must interpret all of the rest in the light of that clear declaration. And there's no reason to start reading plurality of persons in the Old Testament uh, God. As for the Spirit of God, clearly the Spirit of God is, is a, a different way of speaking of God himself. It's a euphemism, and that's the best way of interpreting that in the Old Testament, so that the, uh, the doctrine of the oneness of God is preserved. Otherwise, you give these texts uh, the meaning which Anthony is uh, trying to give them, you end up with a plurality of gods. And yes, Christians will keep saying, but there is only one God, but how to make the three one, this becomes a, a perpetual problem that nobody has been able to solve. solve. Uh, notice that Anthony at one point said, let's ditch, ditch the word Godhead. And later on, he apologized for using the word Godhead again. And that's fine. I understand. It's become common uh, uh, parlance among Christians. Uh, and it's hard to get rid of. And if you ditch the word Godhead, you're going to replace it with something else. You're going to say the divine essence or something. You have to have something to speak of the one and, and not say that th that alone is, is God. You have to have a way of saying that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, but there is only one God. Uh, so what is that one God? Call him Godhead, call it the divine essence, call it the divine nature or whatever. You have to invent terms beyond what the Bible actually says. So the statements like, let us make man in our image, uh, have to be understood in that polytheistic context. Uh, but of course, to interpret it within the, the Bible as a whole, we have to say that somehow it's mu it must mean that there is only one God, but he is using a plurality, uh, perhaps to say a plural of majesty, and, and that's a way of preserving uh, the monotheistic uh, context of the Bible itself. Otherwise, you would go and see that uh, God made them man and woman. And that's in the image of God. And then you would have to say that God is both man and woman. And of course, nobody would stretch it to, well, at least not Anthony would stretch it to that. Some feminists uh, may. Uh, but but you, you see the difficulty in trying to give these passages the meanings that Anthony wants to give them. Uh, now, in Exodus chapter 3, uh, the angel of the Lord is speaking, and the angel of the Lord declares himself to be God. But you have to understand that in terms of agency. Uh, as God's agent, uh, the angel can speak on behalf of God. That's the way of preserving the monotheism. Otherwise, you get wild out of place. You have God, you have God's angel, both are God, and you don't know in the end how, how you can have one God. And notice that in Acts of the Apostles, when this incident is spoken about by, uh, in Stephen's words, Stephen says that it was an angel who appeared uh, to Moses. So therefore, uh, Stephen himself interpreted this differently, or Acts of the Apostles' writer interpreted th this differently to mean not that uh, this was God, but this was an angel. And it's not the angel of the Lord, but an angel, which means that this is not a sui generis. This is not the only God. This is one of a type of being called angels. Uh, he says that the Spirit uh, comes from the Father, and yet the Spirit is uh, Jehovah. Well, as I indicated, the, the Spirit may have been a way uh, of speaking of, uh, of God euphemistically, instead of speaking directly that God did this, it, you know, one says the Spirit of the God, uh, the Spirit of God uh, does this, but the Spirit would be a sort of force that comes out from God and does things. This is how the writers uh, prefer to say it, but they're not speaking about another person in divine Godhead. Uh, they are not speaking of uh, of, of uh, is a third person of the Holy uh, Trinity. Uh, he says that I uh, refer to John one one. Uh, actually, not directly. I was quoting John chapter one verse number two. Hutos uh, in an arche prostantheos. He was uh, prostantheon. He. Uh, this is the one who was in the beginning with God. If John had just finished calling God, uh, calling Jesus God in uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, why would he now say, this is the one who was with God? No, he, he didn't call God, uh, Jesus God in John chapter 1, verse 1. He was saying that Jesus is the Logos and the Logos was with God. And this Logos had a divine 
uh, uh, quality. And this is how uh, Wallace, uh, in his uh, grammar and exegesis of the New Testament, uh, has explicated it. He's not saying, uh, John is not saying that Jesus was God in terms of identity, but he was saying that Jesus has a God quality. And hence, the best way of translating that would be to say that uh, Jesus was the, 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 the Logos was divine, and, and that has been translated by some others in that way, even though Wallace himself did not translate it that way. So no, John uh, John's gospel is not saying explicitly that Jesus is God. You will not find a simple, clear, declarative statement uh, of this uh, type in any undisputed text in the New Testament saying that Jesus is God. You will find things like he is the image of God in Hebrews, but image of God is not exactly God. This is like, you know, if my image is appearing in, on your screens, but that's not me. I am sitting behind my computer, but you're seeing my image. So if uh, Jesus is the image of God, that does not mean that he is God. He is some kind of way, in some way for the author of Hebrews, who should not be presumed to be Paul. Uh, for, for, for some, uh, in some way, the author thinks that Jesus is a reflection uh, of God, but not. he doesn't say that Jesus is God himself. So now, uh, finally, uh, looking at the book of Revelation, uh, look at Revelation chapter 3, verse number uh, 11, uh, where Jesus says, uh, I am coming soon. Uh, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. I mean, how many times does Jesus have to declare that he has a God uh, for people to get the point? Now, uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 spoke about Jesus. Uh, and then in the rest of that uh, uh, preliminary to John's gospel, Jesus is referred to as the begotten God. So he's not fully God. He is the begotten God. He's a lesser uh, sort of God. And this is what we have to understand, that the writers of the New Testament, while presenting Jesus uh, as a divine uh, person, is not they're not presenting Jesus as the second person of the Holy Trinity. They are presenting Jesus as uh, a subordinate being below God, uh, one through whom God created everything else. And that means that he is not the second person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, to prove that these uh, that the Trinity is taught by the Bible, uh, the, uh, Anthony would have to prove that the, the Bible teaches that uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and that the three are somehow one God. And when we turn to the specific writers of the New Testament, uh, we have to see that each one of the writers had all of these beliefs in, in his or her mind as expressed in the writings. Otherwise, you would have to charge them with blasphemy if they just promote Jesus to be God, but they don't have a conception that will make the three one, uh, then they are committing heresy. How much more time do I have? 37 seconds. 37 seconds. Okay. So then, uh, in, in summation, uh, uh, Anthony will uh, cite passages like uh, uh, Titus and Peter uh, uh, and, and so on uh, to indicate that Jesus is God, or Romans chapter 9, verse number 5. But all of these are disputed in terms of their translation. So there is no clear, undisputed text in the New Testament, in terms of its uh, authenticity and proper translation, that will indicate uh, that Jesus is God. That would actually declare this. Uh, you might find some text that you can tease to make it look that like that way, patch together this text plus that text in the proof texting type of way. But seeing the big picture, we realize that this is not true. That is not what the New Testament writers believe, nor did the Old Testament writers believe. They believe that there is only one God, and Jesus is subordinate to that one God. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. We are going to now move to our last rebuttal phase before we do closing remarks. Gentlemen, you'll have 10 minutes in this phase each. Reverend Rogers, please begin. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Shabir. Uh, you notice that Shabir again went back to history for a good bit of uh, time. He gave some reasons for that. I'll gloss over those. I'll entertain this line of thought for, for just a moment. Notice that he said that there's nothing about the Son being worshipped in the Apostles' Creed. So there must be clear development because later, supposedly, that's found in the Nicene Creed. So let me point out something to you. The Father's not worshipped according to the Apostles' Creed. 
Does Shabir seriously think that Christians are developing their doctrine of the Father as God? They didn't believe that to begin with? No, this is just bad historiography, people. The, the fact is the earliest fathers taught the deity of Christ. The ones who affirmed the Apostles' Creed, he questioned whether that's true in the case of Justin Martyr. Here, I'll just leave it to you and also to Shabir to go back and do the homework on that. I don't have Justin Martyr sitting up here on the table, but I can assure you that the Apostles' Creed was the baptismal formula used by the early church. This was how they catechized early Christians. They all believed it. And so when Justin Martyr confesses that Christ is God, that the angel of the Lord is God and so forth, it shows you how they understood the Apostles' Creed. But more importantly is what the text of the Bible says, which is actually the topic of our debate. Does the Bible teach the doctrine of the Trinity? And most clearly the Bible does. It does so from the very first chapter of the Bible to the end. In fact, Shabir made reference to the first verse of the Bible, but uh, to be uh, frank with you, did not accurately handle the Hebrew. He said the word Elohim in that verse means God's. No, it does not. It says, and he also got the uh, syntax wrong, but the, the verse actually says, Bereshit bara Elohim. Elohim is used there in conjunction with the singular verb bara, meaning he created. It's singular in Hebrew, meaning that Elohim is one, not a, a plurality of, of different gods. But in the same chapter, he's identified as a plurality of persons within him. That is, there, there are three persons within the one God. Let us make man in our image. Shabir said this could just be a plural of majesty. No, it could not. Not according to any Hebrew grammarian. Go read Emil Radiger or Gesenius, the father of all Hebrew lexicons, or Taylor Lewis, a classical biblical scholar, or Gerhard Hazel, an Old Testament scholar. They all tell you there's no such thing as a plural of majesty when it comes to verbs and pronouns in Hebrew. The, the word na'ase in, in Genesis 126, let us make, is a verb. There's no such thing as a plural of majesty with respect to verbs. So it cannot be a plural of majesty. And by the way, it's not also reflective of the Israelite belief in a plurality of, of gods. He says this is all being written at a time when they believed in a plurality of gods. The people at the time of the Exodus believed in a plurality of gods under Moses. Moses is the one who wrote Genesis. Moses wrote the Torah. The same Moses that Dr. Ali keeps quoting, Deuteronomy 435, 439, 64, where it says there's only one God. That Moses, who was a monotheist, refers to God as, uh, as a plurality of persons. Okay? Uh, Dr. Shabir says that you know, it's, uh, uh, this kind of thing is reading back into the Old Testament. It says who? Uh, I keep pointing to the text that quote, uh, refer to a plurality of persons. I'm not the one putting those things in the text. They're already there. And it's the same text that identify the Father as God. Deuteronomy 32, Jeremiah 1, 4, uh, Jeremiah 3, 4, Malachi 1, 6, Malachi 2, 10. It's the Old Testament text that puts the Father in there. It says he is God. It's the Old Testament text that says the angel of the Lord is God in Exodus 3, where he's referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in verse 4, where he's referred to as I am who I am, verse 14, as Jehovah, verse 15. I didn't put those things there. They're there in the text. I didn't say that the Spirit is the God of Israel in, in 2 Samuel 23. I wasn't even there when it was written. I didn't put this in the text. I also wasn't there when the ancient Jews wrote the Targums. The ancient Jewish Targumim interpreted these things long before I was around, long before Jesus and the apostles were around. And when they interpreted Genesis 126, for example, Targum Neophyte, they said that it, God was speaking to his eternal word, his memra, his logos, and to his shechanah, his glory, his spirit. That's what the Targumim said. I'm not reading this into the Old Testament. The text was there before I was, and so were these interpretations. So the apostles weren't making this stuff up either. When they taught the same high Christology, in fact, the same high pneumatology, doctrine of the Spirit, that the Spirit is God, not just an impersonal force. I gave numerous arguments for why the Spirit's not merely a force, by the way, and uh, again, respectfully, those weren't addressed. The Spirit is given is ascribed a mind, according to Isaiah 40. The, the Spirit is said to speak, 2 Samuel 23. Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel, I mean, over and over again, the Spirit speaks according to the Bible. Forces don't speak. Uh, so this just is not uh, uh, true to say that the Spirit is not clearly portrayed as a person, but as some kind of force. In fact, uh, Shabir keeps suggesting that I'm reading these things back into the Old Testament, but I submit to you that reading Star Wars theology back into the Old Testament is really what's uh, anachronistic. 
The idea that the Spirit's just some force from God that we tap into like Yoda is not taught in the Old Testament. This is pure mythology, not theology. Uh, moreover, Shabir, again, he says he wasn't quoting, uh, he says John doesn't declare that Jesus is God. He was quoting verse 2 where he says this one was in the beginning with God. My whole point was that he glossed over. He says John couldn't be saying Jesus is God because verse 2 says he was with God. But verse 1 says that too while also saying that he is God. It says, in the beginning was the word, and in our case, in halagos, kai halagos ain't pros tan theon, kai theos, and God, kai theos ain halagos, and God was the word, the word was God, in English syntax. And, and he quoted Wallace, who's a Greek grammarian, by the way. He quoted Wallace saying it doesn't really mean that he's God. It's just saying that he has a divine quality. He's, he's kind of God-like in, in the sense that he's, he's very exalted. Here's what Daniel Wallace says in his Greek grammar beyond the basics, page 269. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 stresses that although the person of Christ is not the person of the Father, their essence is identical. The construction the evangelist chose to express this idea was the most concise way he could have stated that the Word was God and yet was not the person of the Father. That's Dan Wallace. That's what Greek grammarians say. The word is uh, uh, a preverbal predicate nominative. In fact, it's moved to the emphatic position. It's stating that Jesus is God in the most emphatic way you could possibly ask him to do so. And he does it again in verse 18. Shabir says, again, it's a subordinationist verse because it says uh, monogenes theos, according to at least the critical text, uh, because that means only begotten God. Well, that's not how even Wallace would, would interpret that. Wallace would understand that to mean God, the one and only, the word monogenes pointing to his uniqueness, not to uh, anything, even his begetting. Uh, so again, uh, Wallace wouldn't agree with that. John 20, 28, the, the word Jesus is referred to as uh, ha theos. He even uses the article. Right? My Lord and my God, referring to Jesus, Thomas, said to him, my Lord and my God. Uh, we're, we're told that the only times the, the New Testament refers to Jesus as God, uh, these passages, that they're, they're disputed by, uh, by scholars and so forth. Well, this is a debate. Let's suppose they are disputed. What I need is it's not just telling me that somebody else disagrees with this. What I need are, are arguments. But that's what you do in a debate. You give arguments for your position if something is disputed. It should be right on, the on all sorts of things. Uh, that's why we have these dialogues. And I think if he doesn't agree that Romans 9.5 calls Christ God overall, then we should have been given some arguments for that, like we're attempted in the case of John 1.1. Uh, he says Titus 2.13 doesn't declare Christ to be God. It's a classical construction. I mean, there's no real question there of what that means uh, in, in terms of Greek grammar. Uh, we're told that the angel of the Lord should be understood in terms of agency. In other words, an agent can speak on behalf of the one who sent him, and so therefore he could he could speak and act as though he were God when he really isn't God, right? Uh, and, and I would certainly grant that you can have an agent who represents you, but anytime an agent goes around and starts, you know, using your calling himself by your name and usurping your exclusive rights and prerogatives, I can assure you that is not a principle of agency taught in the Old Testament or by any Jew. Uh, for example, uh, if I send somebody as my agent and he's representing me, that doesn't mean he gets to have relations with my wife just because he's representing me. Well, the angel of the Lord receives divine worship in Exodus 3, in Joshua 5, in Judges 6, in Judges 13. The exclusive right of God to be worshipped is received by the angel of the Lord. He's not a mere representative. He's not a mere agent. He is a divine person who is in his own nature, in his own right, God. Uh, we're, we're told that uh, the book of Hebrews simply says that Jesus is a reflection of God. No, it doesn't. Uh, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the identical expression, the effulgence, the outshining of God's very uh, nature and essence. He created the ages. He's called God in verse 8. He's said to be the unchanging Lord who created the, the heavens and the earth in verse 10. All throughout the book of Hebrews, the exalted Christ is, is given the most exalted descriptions. They're not uh, merely uh, indicative that he is a reflection of God. In Hebrews 13, 8, Paul says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, calling Christ immutable, an attribute exclusive to God. Uh, we're told that uh, Jesus isn't God according to Revelation because Revelation 3.11 talks about people falling down at the feet of Christians on the final day. Oh, I think my time is up. Yes, sir. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. We are now going to go to Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, you're free to begin your 10-minute rebuttal. Okay. Uh, 
All right. So uh, thank you again, Anthony. Uh, that too was a spirited response that I really appreciate. Uh, now, you say that the Father is not worshipped in the Apostles' uh, Creed, but of course the, the, the uh, Godhood of the Father is not in dispute in the Apostles' Creed. Rather, it is stated pl quite plainly. I, it starts by saying, I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. So there's a distinction between the one who is called God, the Creator of heaven and earth, and the one who is called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called Son, but He's not called God. He's called Lord, but He's not called God. And we know that Lord is an ambiguous title. It can be just simply a title of respect given to a human being. So there's no clear indication in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus is actually God. And uh, then we come to the Nicene Creed in which he's declared to be very God of very God. And you're telling me there's no development from the Apostles' Creed to the Nicene Creed. Uh, and now, you said that there's no plural of majesty in the Old Testament. And by the way, I don't claim to uh, know Hebrew. I'm just start starting to learn it myself. But uh, clearly, it says, Bara ber uh, Bereshit Elohim. Uh, and Elohim uh, there is translated God. And, and that's how I would like to see it translated. However, uh, it, the term Elohim by itself is a plural term. And as I pointed out, uh, the, the writers of, of the Bible making use of this term, uh, they have been ambiguous with it, sometimes using it as a plural term with plural verbs. Uh, sometimes they use it as a singular term. It means that the writers of the Bible at this stage uh, were not quite sure what to make of the concept of the oneness of God. Eventually, that concept develops even in Old Testament times. You say that Moses wrote all of this? No. Uh, today, scholars are, are um, clear that uh, there are different strands of narrative that went into the writing uh, of the Pentateuch, the first five books uh, of the Bible from Genesis uh, to Deuteronomy. And uh, they identify these trends uh, by the uh, letters J, E, P, D, J for Jehovah, E for Elohim, P for the priestly narrative, and uh, D for the Deuteron Deuteronomist uh, writing. Uh, J, they identify with uh, those passages which, I, which uh, call God Jehovah. And E, they identify with those passages that call God Elohim. And when these were all put together, uh, eventually by the priests, uh, we, we find that they not largely preserved the different strands of writing, but they also tried to conflate them uh, so that they can form a continuous story. But the gaps in the story are evident. This is why we have the creation described twice, Genesis chapter 1 and then in Genesis chapter 2 all over again with the creation of uh, human beings. And then we, we have the flood of Noah described uh, twice uh, with different numbers of animals. Uh, we have uh, the lie that Abraham supposedly told, uh, repeated by Abraham uh, with two different kings, and each time he walks away rich. And then his son uh, tries the same strategy as well. Isaac does the same with Rebecca, saying that she, he, she is my sister. Uh, so uh, how, what explains all of these duplicate narratives? With In one narrative, we find that God's name is Jehovah. In the other narrative, God's name is Elohim. Uh, the scholars have said these are different strands. Uh, the people in the north wrote using the name Jehovah. People in the south wrote their, their history using the name Elohim. Eventually, the priests spliced these narratives together to form the continuous whole that we now have as the Pentateuch, putting their own cement in between uh, as they stitch the narratives uh, uh, together. So that explains why we have this uh, sense of plurality in, in the Old Testament. It's because it's reflective of a plurality in the Canaanite background of Israelite history. But of course, that has to be tamed uh, by the, the clear, declarative, simple statements in the Bible, in the Old Testament in particular, where it says that uh, there is only one God, uh, such as Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse number 39. And then uh, re read Isaiah uh, in, in context. Uh, second Isaiah uh, latched on to this uh, uh, idea of the oneness of God because that became popular in the time that second Isaiah was writing uh, following the uh, reform of uh, King Josiah in the year 610 uh, B.C., and, and now, with uh, monotheism being in vogue, uh, second Isaiah is writing, Isaiah chapter 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. All of these are clearly declarative that there is only one God, the one who is called Jehovah. And uh, Anthony, you didn't quite answer the point. If you are saying that Jesus is Jehovah, 
then what business does he have to say that he is the only God while he has a father that he is calling his God? He could not be then the only God. The only one who could be called the only God is, is the father himself. And so while it is true that John 17, 3 does not say that only the father is the only God, but contextually, that's the only thing that makes sense. He is the only God and only he is uh, the only uh, God. Uh, and if you say no, uh, then you have to have an explanation. How can you say that Jesus is Jehovah and he says that he is the only God and yet he has a God who is his father. Now, as for and an angel uh, uh, appearing to um, Moses uh, in, in Sinai uh, in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse number 14 and forward. I, I pointed out that in Acts of the Apostles, that angel is identified as an angel, which means he's not a sui generis. He, he, he's one of a kind and God is not of a kind. So we cannot say that that angel is actually God, though he speaks on behalf of God. And the better way of explaining that is to say divine agency. Yes, divine agency does not mean that your agent can sleep with your wife. That's true. Uh, but there are certain things that a power of attorney gives a person to do, and these are limited. So in the Old Testament, can the agent of God, can the king who is ruling on God's behalf, have, receive worship we see that happening first corinthians chapter 29 verse number 20 the people bowed down and worship god and the king so uh, th this is old testament times you have to understand that period and not to interpret it anachronistically putting today's ideas into that social milieu and context now uh, anthony you say that uh, the targumim clearly speak of the word as being the memra and and the shekhinah and that these ideas therefore were there before the new testament writers picked them up but then notice where you're saying that the new testament writers got their ideas from from outside of the bible and as i've pointed out since the new testament acknowledges the validity of the old testament it is necessary for the new testament writers to follow the old testament Testament writings. They cannot get their ideas from outside of the, of the Old Testament. They have to get it from inside the Old Testament. And clearly from inside the Old Testament, there is only one God whose name is Jehovah. And uh, though we have mention of Jehovah's word and Jehovah's angel and, and so on and Jehovah's wisdom, you can't multiply all of these and make God into all of these persons. Okay, there's a mention of his presence. So make that also a person in God. And there's the angel of his presence. So that, that gives you another one. No, you cannot add up the gods like this. There is no statement in the Bible that says that there are three and only three persons in the divine Godhead. So if you say that there are three persons, you have to have a biblical warrant for, for saying that there are only three. First of all, to say that there are three, and then you have to have a warrant for saying that there are only three, because once you open up the divine Godhead as you speak and say that there can be a plurality of persons within the Godhead, and look there, that one looks like he's God. Look there, the spirit looks like he's God. Look there, the angel of the Lord looks like he's God. Look there, the word of God looks like he's God. Well, then you can keep multiplying, and there is no limit to how many persons you can have in the divine Godhead. But if you say simply, as the Bible says, in its clear declarative statement, Statements, there is only one God. And then that finishes the, the whole matter. You can say there are some tantalizing verses. There's some puzzling verses. Maybe some of the writers uh, had a plural, pluralistic context, uh, uh, conception uh, and they lived in a pluralistic society in which this was normal for them. But in the end, what does the Bible teach as a whole? As, as a whole, it is clear that it's simple declarative statements always say that there is only one God. God, who is identified in the New Testament as the Father, as is identified in John chapter 17, verse number three, for example. Now, referring to uh, Dr. Wallace, of course, he's a Christian and he defends Christian uh, doctrines. But I refer to something that he admitted, even though he's a Christian. And that is what is more important for our debate tonight, because he has admitted that in John chapter one, verse number one, uh, the, uh, the meaning is not that uh, Jesus, uh, like grammatically, the meaning is not that the word was God in terms of identity, but that the word was God in terms of 
quality. And the best way, as I said, uh, to translate that, as some other uh, person has translated it, is to say that the word was divine. And then everything makes uh, sense. And it makes sense why uh, uh, John would follow up by saying, this is the one who was in the beginning with God. Uh, notice that in order for Wallace to reach the, the conclusion that this teaches that Jesus is God, he has to make the word God there mean father. But there's nothing in the text that makes the word God father. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. We are now going to move to our final phase, and that is closing statements from each of our participants. Participants, you have five minutes each. Reverend Rogers, you're free to begin. All right, I want to thank Dr. Ali for this rousing debate and thank all of you for listening. Uh, let me just sort of uh, remind you of some of what we've seen, and hopefully you'll be able to use this to go back and analyze this debate further. I have made the argument that both the Old and New Testaments teach the divine or the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I pointed out that this is rooted, in fact, in the grammar of the text. And in order to try and scuttle this point or get around this, I think Shabir, who has admitted that he doesn't know Hebrew or Greek, uh, has butchered the language. He even repeated the same error regarding Genesis 1-1 that I corrected in my previous remark. Genesis 1-1 says, Bereshit bara Elohim. Bara means he created. Elohim is not being used as a plural there. There are other terms like this. And that is not what scholars, what is, I mean, we're not referring to a noun when I talk about, uh, he said the plural of majesty accounts for Genesis 1, 126. But I was talking about verbs and pronouns, not the noun Elohim. Elohim is a noun in Hebrew. I said in, in, with respect to verbs and pronouns, there's no such thing as a plural of majesty. So that does not refute the point based on Genesis chapter 1. And the, the language was also, I think, butchered, not just I think, but I'm sure, was butchered with respect to the New Testament. Dan Wallace does not say that Christ is something less than absolute deity. When Wallace makes the distinction between the qualitative use of theos, he's not saying that the Son is, is God in some lesser sense. He's saying that the Son is God by nature. He's making a distinction personally between the Son and the Father, but saying the Son is by essence what the Father is. That's not the point that Shabir is trying to make. So I don't think that Shabir knows the languages. Uh, and that's also reflected when he makes reference to Acts chapter 7, by the way. Uh, Acts chapter 7, he keeps saying it says, an angel. Angelos tu kuriu does not mean an angel. There's no uh, indefinite article in Greek. That has to be determined from other factors. And Dan Wallace, since we've been talking about Dan Wallace, Dan Wallace argues over and over again that it should be taken or understood as definite. The angel of the Lord. Hey, everything in this debate, I uh, humbly would have to say, is on my side. The Bible teaches a plurality of divine persons in both Testaments. It teaches a high Christology, a high pneumatology in both Testaments. And the New Testament writers, Shabir, uh, attributed to me, imputed to me the idea that the New Testament writers got this from the Targums. That's not what I said. I said the Targumim, who were not Christians, who were before Christians, saw this in the Old Testament as well. They drank from the same well, the same water as the New Testament writers. They arrived at this conclusion. If it's not there, if Anthony Rogers is just reading this into the text, how in the world did these ancient Jewish Targumim know what I was going to be thinking 2,000 years later? How did they know what the developed creed of Constantinople or the Athanasian creed was going to say so that they could put this in their Targums and say this is what Genesis 126 is talking about? This is what all these other passages are talking about. Throughout the debate, one of the things that Shabir has mentioned is this is clear or that's clear. But that, you know, saying so doesn't make it so. It's not, a, you know, the, this is arbitrary. It's a shell and pea game. Whatever verse I like is clear. Whatever verse I don't like is not clear. Well, let me tell you, it's just as clear when God says, let us make man in our image, that us is a plural personal pronoun pointing to a plurality of persons, as it is clear when God says, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? But it doesn't say one person. I'll, you want to know what's ambiguous in all of this? Is interpreting one as meaning one person when it never says that. Not even in John 17, 3. You heard Shabir say that in John 17, 3, Jesus calls the Father the only true God, and there's nothing in the context to suggest that Jesus could be included in that identity. Wait a minute. Isn't there a verse 5 in John 17? Doesn't Jesus just two verses later say, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world became? Notice the contrast, by the way. Jesus is saying the world became, and he existed with the Father before that. That's the same point being made in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and R.K. in Halagos, the Word already was. 
And then he goes on to say that the world became through him, literally in the Greek, all things became. And without him, not one thing became. The Son has always existed. Everything else became. That's the point Jesus made in John 8. Before Abraham became. Prin genestai, prin Abraham genestai. Before Abraham became. Ego emi, I am. Now the New Testament clearly teaches the deity of Christ. Just like the Old Testament. Just like the ancient Targumim. Just like Justin Martyr who believed in the Apostles' Creed. Just like all Christians who confessed the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed the Constantinopolitan Creed, the Athanasian Creed. This is the faith of the Christian church. This was the faith of the ancient Jewish church. This is the faith of the whole Bible. Thank you, Reverend Rogers. We will now begin. Uh, Dr. Ali, you can have your uh, time for your five-minute closing statement. Yes. Um, now, uh, folks, uh, for my final uh, uh, closing, I would like to reflect on what um, uh, we, we, the, the various threads of argument that uh, will wrap this debate up into a, a final bundle. Now, uh, uh, Anthony has cited many passages from the Old and New Testament, uh, which, according to him, would indicate that Jesus is God. I took a broader view to look at his history and the social milieu in which the writers of the Old and New Testaments lived and try to understand the writers in, the term, in terms of that historical uh, milieu. And uh, we saw that they lived in a polytheistic context and uh, they said some things which might be interpreted as meaning that God is more than one. And uh, Christians uh, who have adopted uh, Trinitarianism can look at those uh, texts and say, well, there it looks like uh, somebody else apart from the Father is uh, is God or he has divine qualities. But I, I've tried to show that there are simple, clear, declarative statements in the Old and New Testaments that indicate that there is only one God. And the simplest way of understanding that is to say that that means that there is only one God and God is one person. Uh, it, 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 there's no need to specify that there's one that God is one person. When Anthony and I introduced ourselves at the beginning of the, this evening's uh, proceedings, uh, we spoke about who we are. Uh, nobody should assume, okay, well, he didn't say he's not schizophrenic, so maybe he is actually two persons in one. Uh, uh, that, that's, not, that's not what we are going to conclude. So there's no reason to conclude that. The only reason that people have concluded that is because that they have taken Jesus to be God, and then they had to know, what are we going to do with the fact that there is only supposed to be one God? How could Jesus be God? Well, then they didn't know what to do. So uh, some thought, well, he is the same God as the Old Testament. Some thought, no, he's the son of the God of the Old Testament. And, uh, and some thought, well, you know, he's the son of Jehovah, and Jehovah is the only God. And some thought, well, no, he is Jehovah himself. And Jehovah has a father who is the supreme being, uh, like the Mormons uh, seem to believe today. Uh, so, so there's a wide variety of possibilities uh, to, to pin on the minds of the writers of the New Testament. And, and the, the better way, uh, if, you, if Christians want to preserve monotheism and say, yes, we believe that there is only one God, the simplest way is to interpret those tantalizing statements as uh, referring to agency, uh, uh, whereas the agent can, of God uh, might be referred to in, in a certain way or by referring to a, a, a being that God has created and through whom God is dealing with everyone else, a sort of mediator. So through mediation and agency, all of these passages become understandable. The uh, writers of the uh, New Testament in particular are not saying that Jesus is God himself. They are saying that Jesus is the agent of God. They're saying that Jesus is the one through whom uh, God created everything else. And so in that sense, Jesus can be referred to as a creator because when we look up, instead of seeing God, we're seeing Jesus because he stands between us and or hovers between us and uh, the uh, creator God, uh, the almighty, his father. Uh, but uh, uh, when, when this is understood, we see that everything falls into place. This is why he can say that I, he existed before Abraham, uh, because uh, he existed not as God, but as God's agent through whom everything else is created. Uh, this is why he can say that he had a glory uh, with God uh, before the creation of the world, because he had a glory after God uh, uh, begat him, and then he 
according to John's gospel, and he becomes now the only begotten God. Now, and Anthony Wallace, uh, 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 Anthony cited Wallace, uh, and uh, he thinks that this is in his favor. Well, yes, uh, but but not so much because uh, to cite somebody who shares your own belief doesn't really prove your point. To cite an independent person proves your point, or to cite what your opponent believes to be the authority on the on the on the question that proves your point. Now, I don't believe uh, uh, Wallace to be the authority on this question. Clearly, he is a Trinitarian himself. He's going to support Trinitarian belief. I only cited him to say that even though he uh, supports Trinitarian belief, he admitted that in John chapter 1, verse number 1, the term God there uh, used for the Logos is not in terms of divine identity, but in terms of divine quality. And for him to get to the idea of Trinity, he has to assume that the first mention of God is uh, with the meaning father, but this is what I referred to as the fallacy of equivocation. So in some folks, the Old Testament and the New Testament teach that there, that there is only one God and not a trinity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. This concludes our discussion. Please, yes, please applaud. I want to thank, I want to thank both panel members on the discussion for your promptness. That was very helpful for this discussion. We are What we're going to do now is we're going to take a small break until 3.15. Before and during our next discussion that we're going to have, we're going to be handing out some slips. We're going to be taking three questions for each of our discussion panelists that will be asked at the conclusion of the next discussion. So think of, three, uh, think of a question that you would like to ask. You'll be handed a piece of paper. We'll then select a total of six. We'll be back here at 315. Thank you. Okay.